Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Peculiar Book Club. We're very excited to have you here tonight. We have a double feature. We've never done this before, so it's going to be a big night for us. We're starting a little bit early, and that's partly because we were trying to welcome some of you from the UK when I know that the hour gets a little late. But late hours is actually a great time to talk about body snatching, so I'm really excited to introduce our guest tonight, Wendy Moore, and I know that Davey's super excited about it, too. Uh -oh, I'm muted. You, <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm so glad to be joining everybody again for another peculiar night. And I'm really excited about this one because I I, I noticed something in this book and I'm not sure if uh, the subject of this book is the hero or the villain of this book. So I'm hoping Wendy <laughs> can shed some light on that for us. So without further ado. Wendy Moore. Hello. Welcome to the Peculiar Book Club. Hello, it's great to be here. Lovely to meet you both. We are so excited to have you on tonight. And as you know, we we came up with a specialty themed cocktail and I know that you made your own. I you did, did. You did. You did. It's beautiful. <laughs> um, I would like to call out of the ether my cocktail. Let's see if we can rise it up from the, you know, the nether regions to thank you. Thank you thing. Um, it's lovely having an assistant. <laughs> Um, but uh, this this was an exciting and fun time, Did, and I know some of you said you made your own shrubs. Is that is that so from our, our group out there? Oh yes, yeah. so a couple people said they worked on their own, uh, putting their shrubs together and everything. Um, I enjoyed it. Did you make your own or did you buy yours? I made mine too. I've never made it before, so it was quite fascinating. I think yeah. mentally grew for a, a week, but I only did it for a day, so I don't want it to go to take <laughs> I think um, I've got a kind of butter knife, so I don't think John Hunter could have done much surgery with that. Probably so not. Probably maybe not. Maybe scoop no, an uh, eyeball out or something. I, I tell you what, it's it's really good. And I, I had made it for the first time for some soda for actually a non-alcoholic cocktail, but mixing it with a little white rum and a little lime, and I felt like we had a very nice... Um, a little nice mixture and it has just the right color for you know stiffening up an apron yep. uh yep. The... <laughs> it's definitely very bloody isn't it <laughs> yeah so let me ask um did you have a favorite a favorite name wendy i, I know i put mm. the, the name up here these were some of the ones that came in as uh possibilities mm -hmm. um well i have to confess i think the first one bloody scary was mine so i better bloody not scary was yours <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I've got a bit of a, a penchant for um, strawn and quartered, personally. Strawn like and quartered. Who? Now I know. Um, I'll have to go back and look at the. Uh, if you want to note, if you want to sort of raise your hand and say if that was yours, please do. Otherwise, I'll go back and look at the notes. But I know that was a really good one. Strawn and quartered with our strawberry that looks like a heart. And I think that it's it's actually really nice. So I hope you guys are enjoying your cocktail. I'm going to set mine to one side right now. We have just a tiny little bit of order of business that we're going to, uh, I'm, I'm mentioning now so we don't forget it later, to let people know who won the signed copy and also who won those lovely earrings from the, uh, the operating theater. So we'll get back to that. But I'd like to start by saying, first of all, welcome. And secondly, Wendy, before we get started and we unleash the wonderful questions on you, do you want to say a little bit about how you got interested, how you fell in among the hunters? Um, well, this is this was my first book, The Knife Man. So um, I think I'd always wanted to write a book from as far away, far as you know, long back as I can possibly remember. But I spent 20 years um, as a journalist, um, so really a very long detour before I started writing books. And I mostly wrote about medicine and health, so that was my interest. And I started to get interested in the history of medicine, and I just couldn't believe all the incredible stories that um, erupted from the history of medicine. So I did a diploma course, um, and I was really kind of looking for a book idea for my first book idea. And Hunter just jumped out at me. I mean, he, um, as Davey said, you know, I was just entranced by the idea of whether he was a hero or a villain. He was, um, you know, a, a brilliant surgeon, um, a great scientist. He's, you know, very much revered by a lot of doctors today still. 
Um, but, you know, chose very um, dubious means to um, do his, his research, um, you know, very involved with body snatching, um, performed experiments on living animals, um, lots of experimental operations, transplanted teeth. So quite yeah, a I lot. love that story. <laughs> yeah, quite a lot of dark side to him. Um, so, so my whole kind of research uh, journey was really trying to decide for myself whether mm. the ends justified the means and whether he really was um, a hero or, or a villain. I, I really enjoyed it. And of course, my, my introduction to the Hunters came from my research, uh, my doctoral research on William Hunter. And so I kind of came across, I came across the other brother. Of the two, I think, I think, I think I find John more likable. <laughs> yes, I know. I think, I always think you have, you can't like them both. You've got to like one or the other. Yeah, you've got to pick one. <laughs> Um, and William was, you know, very clever, um, you know, a, a great um, self-promoter, but mm -hmm. I think quite a vain man and yeah. um, quite sort of um, quite um, selfish in a way, you know, um, whereas I think John was so much more gregarious and outgoing. And mm -hmm. I think if you were at a dinner party, you'd want to sit next to Yeah, John that I think, I think it William. Would be right. yeah. So we're having some of our questions come in now. So this first one from Mike Breen, who who's a regular guest here and always has great questions. Um, I love the book too, Mike, <laughs> of all the various scientific luminaries. Who do you think he had the most influence on? I think that's a great question. Okay. Um, well, I mean, he he taught uh, something like a thousand um, pupils. I'm getting too hot, so I'm going to take my Alexander McQueen um, skull scarf. Very off, beautiful. Which, I love it. <laughs> Pages. didn't buy it myself it was um bought for me by the film crew who did the pilot of the book um yeah so he taught something like a thousand pupils in his time and I think that was his most important um a, a, you know contribution really that he passed on this doctrine of um a scientific approach to surgery to so many uh, future doctors um uh, both in from the UK and a lot of them from America who went back and set up the first uh, medical schools um, and so he influenced, you know, at least a thousand doctors to wow. to think for themselves, to um, experiment, to make observations, and then to apply the results of experiments to their work. So that was an absolute revolution in surgery. Uh, I mean, probably the most significant of those pupils was Edward Jenner, um, yes. who was Hunter's favourite pupil, his first house pupil, his favourite pupil, and they corresponded um, throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. And um, Hunter was always encouraging Jenner to experiment. And there's a famous letter where um, Jenner was writing to him and saying um, he had a particular patient, he wasn't quite sure what to do, I think I should do this. And Hunter replied, um, I think your solution is just, but why think? In other words, you know, why just think that it's just, <laughs> why not try the experiment? Why and not so pick that, up that, that knife? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then that's what Jenna did when he tried out the smallpox vaccine. So it's true. Um, that's true. I think um, yeah, I think that's probably the most significant. Yeah, yeah, Susan yeah absolutely <laughs> true about William Hunter. So William and John worked together for 12 years. Um initially John was William's assistant in his anatomy school in Covent Garden. And uh, William really got John on board initially, he was just 20 at the time to look after the dark side of his of his work. So William needed uh, fresh bodies, a constant supply of fresh bodies uh, for his students, um, almost daily, well, nightly, really. And right. so he got John to liaise with the body snatchers. And I think to begin with, um, it was John probably who would go out with the body snatchers right. and bring back these bodies. And then eventually he kind of set up such good relations with them that um, a kind of industry evolved. I just find that fascinating. And I think um, come along here, I've got another question for you, but I would at some point love it if you guys would ask some questions about how the, how the body snatching goes down, because it's, it's not the way I would have thought. It's not like in the movies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Kristen Meston says, uh, Kristen Meston says, why do you think Hunter was taken advantage of? And I thought that, that was interesting too. Um, take advantage of. Um, uh, what, in what way that's of you. do you think was he taken advantage of? I'm just wondering. I personally felt like he was taken a bit advantage of by 
his brother. By, by William, that's true. I mean, I, I suppose um, to begin with, he was in William's shadow. Um, so he did William's dissection work. He did made fantastic preparations of um, body parts, um, did the experiments that William wanted him to. So he was very much uh, doing William's work, but um, they eventually fell out in, in a major way. And that was partly because um, William took the view that anything that happened under his roof belonged to him. So that, that was whether it was a preparation that was done, um, an experiment that was made, or a discovery. And so there were discoveries that um, John really um, was responsible for that William then took credit for. Uh, right. So yeah, I think, so I think that was it. But I think um, then, you know, John eclipsed William in, in anatomy and dissection skills and so enjoy that he, all, yeah he so. became he took he, he kind of took got his own back in the way in the end yeah yeah and, and the I end think it's a great right question there. by sarah <laughs> yeah i well i mean they were 10 years apart um very much chalk and cheese very different mm -hmm. um and you know william was a studious one he was ambitious he went to university he studied surgery, uh, became a physician, went up the social ladder. Um, John was completely different. He hated school, right. hated books. He didn't, he, you know, I think he was probably dyslexic. So he didn't get his information from books. Um, you know, William had studied the great um, classical mm -hmm. um, scientists um, and wanted to kind of stand on their shoulders. John sure. had no time for books or what anybody else wrote. He just wanted to find out things for himself, you know, right. hands on, eyes. do the dissection um, and, um, you know, use his own eyes. So he kind of was completely different. He had no interest in what happened before. He was just wanting to go forward into the future. Well, and I just wanted to quickly go back. Um, she had mentioned his brother and his brother-in-law both, Kristen had said, um, taking advantage of him. And also I see that... Uh, yeah. Susan Ballinger, I thought this too. Um, his concept that somehow everything that happened under his roof was his is it's quite uh -huh. modern, actually. <laughs> quite yeah, a modern, yeah, modern idea. True. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's true, actually, because um, he had later assistants of William also had the same problem, the same falling out with him, and um, William also took a very dim view of um, his assistants getting married, and um, <laughs> He got rid of William Hewson, um, who actually lived with Brent Benjamin Franklin in London, um, because he he got married. So he oh, was dear. a strange he was a strange egg, really. <laughs> so he never got married himself. I, I know. Um, he didn't, did he? No. No. Well, I know he sort of tried to, but um, so we have this. This is a great question about the Hunterian Museum, which I've I've been there myself. Mm -hmm. uh, the giant and how his remains were um, were taken. And you know that that's a fascinating story. So yeah, yeah. I mean, really, I think that was the main hook for me to begin with. I heard about the story of the Irish giant. Um, so for those who don't know, Charles Byrne was born in Ireland, um, grew very tall. He had um, acromegaly, I think I, that's how you say it. Um, so he was about seven foot eight inches tall. And as a way of making his living, he uh, went on the stage to exhibit himself. Um, eventually came to London and immediately caught the attention of John Hunter. John Hunter was interested in any kind of um, abnormality, any kind of quirky um, discovery. So he collected animals that were um, deformed or different. He was interested in dwarfs, um, twins. Um, really, it was part of his big research project, looking into how life was created, how life might have developed over the years. So he was interested in you know, the giant, actually initially approached the giant apparently and um, asked whether he would be prepared to sell his body to him for after his death. Um, it was quite well known that it wasn't very likely he would live very long. Right. And the giant, was, Charles Byrne was appalled at this. So, <laughs> refused and then got his friends to um, agree that they would uh, bury his body in a lead coffin or put his body in a lead coffin when he died and take it to the sea and throw him into the sea. Um, and he duly did die, um, 1783. Um, and John Hunter, he'd actually been, he had a man stalking him to see if he could, um, you know, find out as soon as he died. And... 
it's not absolutely known how he did it, but he got the body. So as far wow, as we know, the most likely outcome is um, Charles Burns' friends did put his body in a lead coffin. They took it um, in a cart to the English Channel to try and put it in the sea. Halfway along, they were um, kind of regaled at an inn and had a few drinks. And John Hunter had um, the undertakers swap the coffin for a coffin full of stones and whisked the body back. And then he, he was obviously quite embarrassed about this one and boiled the body down to just produce the skeleton. And it was four years later that he then put it on display. So he kept He wanted to wait till everything settled down a little bit, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone knew he'd got it. Um, there were lots of rumours flying around. And then he actually opened his museum for the first time to, not to the public, but to observe mm -hmm. as interested people to come and have a look. And um, lo and behold, amazing skeleton was you know, centre center piece in the museum. Um, so, I mean, for me, I... That, I think that was his dark, that was his kind of bad moment, really. Yeah. That was his darkest hour. <laughs> a particularly um, bad one, yeah. I, yeah, I just I, noticed I first... um, Susan said that uh, the, the situation with the brothers was almost a Jekyll and Hyde, but that has a connection to the book, or to John Hunter as well. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's quite either. fascinating, I think, because um, the Jekyll and Hyde story um, apparently came to Robert Louis Stevenson in a dream. But the actually house that the story is based in, it's um, an absolutely um, <clears throat> a totally exact copy of John Hunter's house in Leicester Square. <laughs> so the description in the book, it's like walking through John Hunter's house. And we know that because there are plans that still exist, um, which show what Hunter's house was like. And it was this two facing house. It was um, on the, the house, the front of the house, which faced Leicester Square was where the family lived, where John Hunter received his patients and where his wife had, you know, elegant soiree. She was a poet and a socialite. And then they also had the house at the other end, which actually faced a different road. So that was what's now Charing Cross Road. And in between, he joined the two houses together to create um, a space for his museum and for his lecture theatre. So, it, so it, it kind of, it's kind of symbolic to me that the house faced two ways and and it's kind of like the light and the dark side of his character. Oh, but I don't think he was two-faced at all. I had, I think he was incredibly honest about what he did. Yeah. Um, he tried to advance science. He tried to win people to his arguments. He persuaded people to agree to have um, legal post-mortems. Um, yeah. And he also had his own, he, you know, he asked his students to make sure that his own body was dissected. When he right, died. which is nice because that isn't true of all of the uh, anatomists. Some of them were quite not, not true of William, though. for one thing. No. Um, so Kasia says, uh, if the brothers had modern jobs, what do you think they'd do for a living? And some people have suggested, like pharmaceuticals. That's a suggestion. Well, um, I, I think I, I can half imagine William as a, a banker or something because um, he would just have wanted to make money. Um, you know, he, he had big investments, he bought art and so forth. Um, and he was a social climber, you know, he was in with the royal family. So maybe a politician or um, a banker. I still think Hunter would be a scientist of some, in some way. Um, I think he'd currently be at the you know, forefront of um, trying to um, deal with coronavirus and he'd be urging people to experiment and come up with a solution right. for that. Yeah, because he seemed very, he, he was very interested in the way things worked, wasn't he? Because I, I was surprised at his... Uh, Sometimes having a somewhat um, roguish, feral, I had something of a feral childhood myself. It, it does, you know, it, it encourages that kind of um, curiosity, I think. I just see. Yeah, I, I, I think because he played truant from school and he spent all his time in the fields, you know, cutting up animals and collecting bird's eggs. He just had this incredible curiosity. He wanted to find answers to everything. Right, I see this. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe not right. maybe not a dead cat either maybe not a dead cat um mm. mike Green asks, is there a good way to poke a cat my 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 partner pokes the cat we, we but that's his that's our phrase for um needling me until i get angry enough to scratch um uh, uh, <laughs> uh, oh there's a very, he had, very um, you guys are killing me in the comments here <laughs> <laughs> i mean he had lots of different cats as well and his um had a farm at Earl's Court where he kept um, leopards and um, oh, and amazing. lions. And there was a moment when the leopards escaped and he actually managed to catch them. 
I just think it's so funny to think of Earl's Court as being the countryside because, of course, yeah, you know, it isn't. It isn't anymore. It was, um, a, it was a farm, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, Kristen said, is there an estimated percentage of how much of Hunter's papers were burned? And, and well, uh, not exactly, because I think there are different um, estimations, different stories. Um, so essentially, when Hunter died, his brother-in-law, um, Everard Hume, who was his, you know, his wife's sister, much younger than Hunter, he'd been one of Hunter's pupils, but very sort of um, envious and, um, you know, wanted to kind of get in on the app there. He spent about the next 10 years plagiarising um, Hunter's writings, which had not yet been published, claiming the discoveries for himself, making a name for himself, climbing to the top of the tree of the Royal College of Surgeons. And then he confessed to Hunter's last assistant, this lovely guy called William Clift, who's you know, a big favourite of mine, Cornish boy, um, that he had burnt the manuscripts. So he burnt the rest of them. Um, so it was initially believed that he burnt 100% of them, but clearly he hadn't been, um, partly because William Clift had kept copies of lots of it. Right. Um, so quite a, you know, a fair amount survives. We just don't know how much was destroyed, but included apparently all of um, um, Jenner's letters to John Hunter. So that, that's a huge shame there. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, noticing a couple of questions. One's about the plagiarism that, and, and I think that is really interesting because of course, the 18th century is notorious for this. I, I studied um, a history of anatomy, birth anatomy. So I did William Smelly, uh, <laughs> badly named if you're going to be a gynecologist, yeah. I guess. Um, Hunter's anatomy, gravid uterus anatomy, and all sorts of places where an anatomy would come out and then you'd find out they'd pilfered the drawings or papers from someone else's. So even yeah. the artwork was yeah. plagiarized. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there are lots of... Um, instances uh for you know example like a lot of artists um the artists who did the drawings for the gravid uterus um jan van rinstick um yeah. didn't get credit for his work yeah. um i mean it's partly the lack of um of real connections at the time lack of, lack of right. um peer-reviewed journals for example they wanted they all wanted to claim the same discoveries sometimes they did make the same discoveries at the same time but they wanted to be first there and it was all about you know trying to make a living by making a name for yourself. So having your name on a discovery or a bit of a body was, um, you know, a good way to uh, get your name known out there. Well, and it's funny too, because I actually, we, um, at the uni um, University Library Museum that I was part of, it was a medical museum, we did an exhi exhibition on the artist, Jeanne, um, partly to say like all of this work that everyone talks about, how fascinating the two styles are like, oh, William Smelly's gravid uterus and the, and the anatomical mm. tables that belong to uh, Hunter, they, they look so similar. Well, they would. They hired the <laughs> same artist, you know, um, yeah. who still didn't get any actual, you know, credit. Um, see, very interesting to see his path. Oh, yes, compared to other people, uh, like for, for the forensics study in, in, in science as well. Like he wasn't really trying to keep it all to himself. It, it seemed very much about bringing it to the world, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, that's that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Chisel. <laughs> I used to have a dentist called Dr. Payne, actually. Oh, so. no, that's not a good one. <laughs> um, I just saw a request, and this isn't exactly a question, but I think it's kind of important because I was wondering about it too. You have a lot of artwork behind you, and I was just wondering <laughs> if you have any show and tell back there that you want to do. Oh, okay. Um, nothing really medical, I don't think. I mean, that's really my daughter's um, early artwork. She's now 24 and she'd be hor horribly embarrassed if she knew that anyone was discussing it because she doesn't do any art anymore. She just makes films. Oh. Um, but I love them. Um, and I, Yeah, so just um, nice pictures of cats and uh, there's a, a lion and so on. A lion, leopards, lions, gets us right back to Joan Hunter. Um, Oh yes, and Vesalius, that's a that's another one too, with the where people yeah. were borrowing <laughs> heavily. I had a question myself. So I know a lot about the history of dissection and you know all of that, but when I my the first time I found out that they don't dig up an entire coffin, mm. I was quite surprised. Mm. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So they're just they're just ripping you out of a hole in the ground. And that seems, you know, it says, oh, it's just really easy. You, throw a rope around somebody, you just give it a heave up. 
I, I guess because it's a very fresh body, but it seems like that you might be in danger of just plucking off half of what you wanted. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think, yeah, people have got various perceptions about body snatching, haven't they? And I, I think people, without thinking too much about it, might think, okay, they're getting these bodies that have been there for weeks or months and then they fall, right. fall apart. But in fact, they didn't want bodies that were decomposing. They wanted the freshest possible bodies. So they wanted bodies that had been buried that day or the day before, the way they found out about those, I mean, one way was to keep an eye on the local graveyards, new grave, great, you know, that's my next subject. But also they had connections with all the undertakers. Um, they knew, obviously, because they were doctors, they knew if a patient died that, with a particularly mm -hmm. interesting uh, medical complaint that they would then go and try and get that body. Um, mm -hmm. So um, the, the key thing was that the body snatchers had to work quickly, especially as it became better known what they were doing. And right. um, people were then trying to uh, keep an, a watch on graveyards mm -hmm. and make sure that their relatives' bodies were not stolen. But basically what they did, and we know this from um, partly from um, a book which was called The Diary of a Resurrectionist. So it's, as far as we know, written by um, one of the body snatchers in the early 19th century. Um, what they would do is they'd go out um, on a dark night, so they didn't want a full moon. Um, they'd use a wooden shovel. They'd the, the graves were generally quite shallow, so only a kind of couple of feet down. So they didn't have to dig very far. And then they would dig down to the head of the coffin, a little kind of shaft down, um, put a grappling hook down to snap off the top of the coffin. I have demonstrated this with um, you know, body <laughs> with, uh, volunteers on occasion, but I haven't currently got a volunteer. My husband's asleep in bed at the moment. Um, <laughs> I can't wake him up for this. Um, but they would snap the lid off the coffin. They were very, you know, sort of cheap, thin wood. And mm. then this is how it's difficult, a bit too difficult to understand, but they somehow would reach down and then put a rope around the, the arms and heave the body out like that. It seems um, like that would be the job of the of the young skinny ones, right? You just sort of shimmy them down. Yeah, yeah, that probably did help, didn't it? Apprentice yeah. of the uh, body snatchers, apprentice. Yeah. Um, I, I want to just quickly because I, you know, I'm a writer too, and so I have a lot of my questions are related to the structure. And I thought yeah. it was really interesting that you begin with the story of the coachman's leg, the the fact that you mm -hmm. begin with this tale of like here's John Hunter saving mm -hmm. somebody, and mm -hmm. and I think that's a really Oh, it was wise of you, because I think if we started with the I'm digging up bodies and shuttling them through the back of my spooky two faced house might might have a different picture. And so um, was, yeah. was it a yeah. way of giving us a kind of um, introduction to him where he's not quite so ghoulish? Yeah, I, mean, I suppose I, you know, if I did a cradle to grave, that would be quite boring. We don't really care about <laughs> him as a child until we know why he was important. Um, so I wanted to start at a point where he was at the peak of his career. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he by this point, he was a celebrated surgeon. Um, you know, he was the highest paid surgeon in Georgian London. Um, and yeah, I wanted to show him doing what he did, which was surgery um, and a significant operation, one which um, showed his method. So his method mm -hmm. of um, decide, you know, finding a problem, trying to work out a solution, testing that um, method on animals usually um, and, and checking it on dead bodies and then having a go at it and seeing if it works. And then um, in, in this particular case, it's one of those situations where the operation was a success, but the patient died. Um, he died sometime later, but not not from the right. operation. But when he died, John Hunter was right there, get his body, <laughs> get the leg, have a look at my handiwork. Yeah, yeah, it had worked. Um, so great success. So it just kind of, um, you know, um, caps, encapsulated um, in miniature what he was about. Um, and yeah, I mean, I suppose like the other kind of way in was perhaps to look at the giant and the collecting and that is a big um part of hunter's life you know he was he was very obsessive and um and obviously went too far in some ways but <laughs> i wanted to give him a <laughs> chance on to in general. <laughs> first appear as somebody who was doing good saving lives which is you know obviously what he did a lot of i one of the other things that occurs to me is that you know we get to, it, there's a period of time when everyone's afraid 
that they're going to be buried alive. And so they have bells and other things put. Mm. But in this period of time, it wasn't so much being buried alive. It was that you might not stay there once you got there. And so I think that's such an interesting idea that it starts off, I'm afraid of being buried when I'm alive. And now it's, I can't even stay in the ground when I'm dead, um, which was, of course, part of the doctor's riot and, and several of the other things that happened. And so I, I do... <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a lot going on in this story because times were changing too. Um, yeah, the, the, the wealthy people. Century. Yeah, I mean the wealthy people who literally believed if their body was dug up after death and cut up, they couldn't be resurrected whole. You know, because a leg would be here and an arm might be here. Um, so there was, you know, the partly deep religious belief mm -hmm. um, that this, you know, wasn't wasn't um, couldn't be done. But yeah, I mean, kind of very deep seated. Um, just kind of emotional human reactions that a lot of people didn't really want their bodies or their loved ones bodies chopped up by surgeons and and maybe you know sort of ending up in a in a jar in a museum somewhere and right. you know clearly a lot of people still feel that but yes, I think yeah. his credit he persuaded people that we need to dissect bodies in order to um, further science so I think that was um a huge uh, contribution that he made. It's, it's interesting because we had Mary Roach on and she was talking about some of the uses that bodies get put to. And I had no idea that, um, I didn't know about the crash test dummies, that bodies, corpses could be used in that way. And so I was mm. filling out, I literally just signed my will this past week, uh, not planning to go anywhere. I just, you know, <laughs> for safekeeping. But, um, and I, I'm, I'm signing it and they're like, well, how do you want, you know, there was tick boxes, you know, for education, you can use my transplantation. And one box was research and I was like, what do they mean? <laughs> I don't want to be a crash test dummy. Uh, so things I've never thought about before, and I don't tend to be very squeamy about that sort of thing. But in the end, I said yes, it was fine. But it, it, it when it's your own body, it is it's hard to dissociate from that. Um, yeah, I yeah. I mean, I think I don't feel sentimental um, about you know what happens to me after. Um, I'm not sure I want to be used as a crash dummy, mind you. Um, right. I know. Uh, but like, yeah, it seems like very you know. Well, it's not very dignified, is it? <laughs> no, and uh, and then there was, you know, there used to be stories in there about um, kind of hijinks in dissecting rooms. And mm -hmm. one of the things I did as part of the research was to go to a dissection class because ah. I kind of wanted to get as close as possible to Hunter's World. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's completely different now because sure. um, it's um, you know very much more clinical atmosphere. There's no, um, you know, they're they're preserved bodies. There wasn't any formaldehyde in Hunter's day um and and you know there's a kind of very dignified um atmosphere right. so, so I, yeah so i wanted to kind of try and get under his skin i suppose really and see what kind of motivated <laughs> him and um it it was quite fascinating because i was quite you know squeamish about the idea of going in but after a few minutes i then became more fascinated really and wanted to kind of understand and i you know kind of began to see why you might just then feel compelled to work out you know why that goes there and how and also how you know how beautiful how, what a wondrous thing the human body actually is it is and i you know um i think three of our four last four guests had been in dissection labs maybe we should make that like a a criteria yeah. davy maybe we just yeah, yeah, yeah. criteria that, everybody yeah. who comes on the show has to go into a di dissection lab um i got a question here and i hope you won't mind um, if we uh, sneak back up here, I got a question related to Endell Street, which uh, is great because uh, actually the signed book copy that people are getting is, is Endell Street. And I was wondering um, if you would mind talking about, I know, we, I know we're talking about this one too, but would you mind asking or answering this well, question? I certainly would not mind because I'm very happy to <laughs> promote my book. Um, so that's my latest book, Endell Street in the UK, and it's actually called No Man's Land in America. Um, so this is my fifth book. Um, I wrote not the life man nearly twenty years ago. I realised I worked out earlier. Um, and then Endless Street. So I kind of after writing Hunter, I kind of wrote a, book, a couple of books on social history, and then I kind of found my way back to medical history because that's you know really still what kind of uh, fascinates me. Me too. And so Endless Street is about um, a hospital, a military hospital run in the centre of London by women, so it was set up by women. It was um, staffed almost entirely by women. women, all women doctors, all women nurses, obviously, women orderlies, um, clerks, accountants, 
um, uh, tra uh, stretcher bearers. And it, it was run under the auspices of the British Army. So it was the only hospital under the auspices of the British Army um, in the First World War to be run and staffed by women. Um, and I came across it, um, the story in the Welcome Library, which I know Brandy will know, the Welcome Library in London, the Welcome Library, the History of Medicine, which is probably my favourite ever library, and saw a picture on the wall there, which is um, this amazing picture of a, an operation, uh, a man on the table, um, all the women, all the people around the body are, are women, so all women doctors, which is unusual enough today. Yeah, I was going to say, even now. Notions of male. Um, so I kind of, that's how I found out about that, you know, heard about that story and then um, decided to research it. Now, you know, what are some of the, um, I'm fascinated by this because I there's still so few places uh, that, that staff only women. I mean, you just don't see it. Um, I was just reading the Barbizon Hotel about the hotel that was that only allowed women to stay and work there. Um, are, were there anything anything that jumped out at you as being particularly surprising about that? Um, well, yeah, lots of things actually. Um, and the two women who set it up, um, the two doctors, Flora Murray and Louisa Garrett Anderson, um, had both been suffragettes. Um, both qualified as doctors, they were life partners as well. So they lived together um, as a married couple. Thank you so much, that's very kind. Um, and so um, they they were, you know, they were, when the First World War started, they wanted to do their bit and help save lives. But at that time, I suppose the most amazing thing is, it's astonishing that these women doctors, there were about a thousand women doctors at the start of the First World War, and they were confined to treating women and children. So it was taboo for women doctors to treat men. Um, it, they weren't kind of, you know, because of um, male doctors really guarding their, protecting their positions, they weren't allowed jobs in major hospitals. Uh, they didn't go to mainstream medical schools. Um, so they were confined to working in hospitals run by women, treating women and okay. children, which is staggering. Um, and th at the beginning of the First World War, they offered their services to the war office. The war office said, you know, go home. We don't want you. Um, so these two women in particular, within six weeks of the war, they decided, well, we're going to go out there ourselves. So they initially went to Paris, ran a hospital there. And then the army doctors came out and looked at it and thought, oh, amazing. They're actually quite good. Um, it's quite well run. Um, so you know, perhaps we actually will have them after all. So then that led the army to say, will you run a hospital in London? Um, and it's still a gamble. Uh, the, um, the chief of the, the chief doctor in the army, um, you know, was taking a gamble on them and was told it wouldn't last six months, but it was a big success, um, treated 26,000 soldiers. And whilst, you know, held up, was kind of called in the newspapers, you know, the best hospital in London, the most successful in London. And then faded from memory. So that was the most amazing thing, perhaps. I, um, to, well, you know, because I feel like we should wrap this back around to the hunters here. Uh, not a lot of stories about women in the book about John Hunter, not, mm -hmm. not loads. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But a lot of them ended up on the dissection table, particularly for William Smelly's gravid uterus uh, mm -hmm. anatomical tables. So were, would you say that... <laughs> Women ended up on the on the on the um, the scalpel side of medicine a lot more than on the other side in the 18th century. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah, well, yeah, for sure, that's true. Um, um, I suppose they, William Hunter in particular, was very interested yeah. in um, uh, pregnancy and um, childbirth. Um, that's partly because that was a very lucrative area, um, and and so male doctors really kept. Um, women out of that as a profession so yeah. um, you know midwives were basically shunted out of the birthing room and male doctors got in there um so yeah that's very that's absolutely true yeah i i actually I did, it's quite interesting i think the relationship of john hunter and his wife in many ways because um it, you know as far as i can make out i think it was quite a you know, um, an equal relationship, quite harmonious, and they were very different. She was you know, quite an intellectual, um, wrote poetry, and had these you know, colorful evenings classes, around the dinner table. Um, 
Sorry? I said, must have been colorful evenings around the dinner table. Um, so they read yeah. a little poetry, get a few, you know, cursing oaths from John and sort of mix it together and you have quite the party. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you kind of wonder what the house was like, you know, because the dissection room was at one end. You know, you, this kind of stench must have crept through. It would cling to your clothes and your hair oh. and your fingernails. Um, and, the, you know, she was immaculately dressed. Um, you know, her side of the house was beautiful. She'd have little assembly rooms, assemblies and so forth, soirees. Um, but they kind of seem to respect each other's space. So maybe that's how it worked, really. Well, you know, I mean, the 18th century, since that was my period of study, and um, it was a smelly place. I mean, I'm not sure that... The streets were literally running with human filth, so I'm not sure. Maybe you'd be like, well, maybe that's just the street outside. Maybe it wouldn't be completely apparent that you were smelling. Well, yeah, yeah. You kind of wonder how you know, good their, no no their noses were, really. But Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, perhaps one of the most amazing things about, like, I found about Hunter was, because the dissecting, the di dissecting room was obviously... Uh, you know, it's obviously a very sensory experience. So there were the smells of the bodies and, um, you know, they didn't wash their hands properly or just with river water. But Hunter went further because he would also, um, so he talked about, you know, the smells and the, mm -hmm. the crackling of the skin in, in winter with the frost. Um, but he also would taste the, um, the various fluids as well. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so he talks about the gastric fluid tasting oh, salty. No. That's, that's not something I want to know, actually. Um, I get so that's, that's funny. Though that's wonderful, though, in a way, because I mean, at least you you can't say that he was like his brother. He certainly wasn't afraid of getting his hands dirty. Um, we've had great questions. I'm going to pause now because, of course, it is it is time for two things to happen. One, I want Davy to come on and do uh, do his part. And two, while we're all three of us here, I just want to announce we have some winners. So those of you who are out there who have joined us tonight, we have one of you gets to win a signed book. And our winner is Dan Goldstein. And we're also giving away, away those lovely uh, blue bottle earrings going with our theme song and that's Lucy Nathan so hopefully you guys are both here if not I'll send you emails in the ether um, but hopefully you guys heard me and you're you're hooraying in the background there so kind of fun all done <laughs> hey all right well I'm going to jump in Wendy I tend to take our conversations and kind of steer them to see where these themes and ideas pop up in pop culture and movies. And then I have a little bit of a quiz for you, if, if you're oh, ready. Oh, no. I promise it's not too challenging, okay. but we do put together a fun quiz for our authors. So okay. uh, I actually had an interesting time trying to find um, some of these themes and some of these things in movies. It doesn't seem like John Hunter has been portrayed in cinema yet, in film yet. Well, there was a pilot um, made for my book, um, and sadly it didn't get the green light, but... Mm um yeah there there were i mean there were um people probably i'm not pleased to, supposed to allow to say who they were but there were people playing william and john hunter and it was all great fun while it lasted oh well well maybe one day we'll get to see it i actually thought yeah. that um george burns uh his are uh, yeah uh charles burns sorry the giant the irish giant charles burn i thought that would make i mean a fantastic mm. movie. the tale of those two um, yeah. It's actually been captured in a non in a fiction form. Um, mm -hmm. There's a novel out by Hilary Mantel called The Giant O'Brien, which yeah. delves much more into the Irish roots and his transition to London mm -hmm. and, and the identity that he had to give up by leaving Ireland. Um, but I think I think that might be a movie that we should we should definitely go to Hollywood and pitch. I think the peculiar yeah. behind the us peculiar on that. Book club yeah, be great. Great. yeah. All you guys <laughs> out there, we're gonna <laughs> I don't know who would play the giant. There is a Spanish film which is very, is very, very similar about a giant, um, and I'm sure it's partly inspired by Charles Burr, actually. Yeah, I was also hoping to find something about Belle Ile and the uh, the Seven Year War, and I just again I came up short. There were a lot of things about what was happening in Canada at the time, uh, but again, not a lot captured. Uh, there is a Morgan Freeman movie that came out in 2012 called Belle Isle, but I believe it's a different, a different island. Um, so yeah, so uh, it's been it was a fun challenge looking through some of this stuff in John Hunter's history and and realizing how much ground there is to still cover and capture and explore the themes of his life. 
Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're going to jump into the quiz. And uh, again, I promise you, it's not a hard one, um, um, but it's one I am calling Anatomy Celebrities. Oh, no. <laughs> so in the book, it talked about how much, uh, you know, parts of the body are named after people. So uh, my first question for you, let's see if you could figure out the celebrity that goes wow. with each part of the body. <laughs> so uh, Lister's tubercle, I believe is pronounced, is a tiny bone in the wrist and a useful landmark when performing wrist surgery. And it gets its name from this famous Lister, the surgeon Joseph Lister, Alton Lister, famous basketball player, or <laughs> Martin Lister, 17th century famed physician. Ooh. Well, I, don't, I don't know the the bow, but I know it must be Joseph Lister, partly because um, he was also inspired by John Hunter, and also because I've read Lindsay Fitzharris's wonderful book about um, Joseph Lister. Yes, our peculiars, we, we just discussed it a few weeks ago, so I'm sure all our <laughs> peculiars were on that one. I had to throw that one in there. All right, question number two. This protrusion, most noticeable in males, protects the larynx and vocal cords and is known as the Adam's apple thanks to this Adam. Was it comedian and movie star Adam Sandler, Adam from the Bible, or uh, Adam Weisenhaupt, who was a German philosopher and the founder of the Illuminati? So is okay. it all a conspiracy? Okay. Well, I think I'm going to go from for Adam from the Bible, because I think the evil Eve obviously fed him the apple and he choked on it and all the sins of the world were then released. <laughs> Correct. Yes, Adam from the Bible. I didn't know it. There was no last name to give, so uh, no <laughs> Adam Sandler for Adam. wasn't it? You're kidding me. <laughs> I know, right? Um, I thought I thought I could have tricked you on that one. All right. Question number three, uh, and the final question: the muscle fibers, and you know, your book got a little bit graphic, so I'm going to go a little graphic here. But the muscle <laughs> fibers, scientifically known as the bulbo canaveris penile fibers, are commonly known as Houston's muscle. Thanks to singer Whitney Houston, uh, Texas lawman Sam Houston, or surgeon John Houston. Oh, tricky, that one. Um, well, I think I'll probably have to go for the surgeon John Houston on that one. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> It'd be good if you tricked me, because I had no idea about that. <laughs> All right. You did a great job on the quiz. Thank you so much for having some fun with us. How did the commenters do here? Oh, I guess the um, commenters weren't playing. The commenters are, are busy time. establishing peculiar productions to sell movies bo from books written by Wendy. So um, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on over here. Yeah, <laughs> they are on a noble um, cause there. Though we did have one quite comment that, given all his work, it's surprising um, that there aren't more more things named after Hunter, and mm -hmm. that is kind of strange, actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 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 yeah. You think we Hunter's grave digging shovel, Hunter's. <laughs> I was hoping for more rope to go around the corpse. I was hoping for more fun stories for body parts like Adam from the Bible, but it turns out it's just mostly people who found the body part in the first place. <laughs> yeah. There's a very funny, um, there's a very funny comedian uh, who talks about the pouch of Douglas. And I now want all of you to Google the pouch of Douglas and hopefully you'll come up with the comedian's name. It's, um, I won't go into details, but I'll, I'll leave okay. you to, to do that as homework for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. Um, Hunter did get a museum. That is, that's absolutely correct. Has a museum. That's true. Yeah. One of the things about Hunter that I am completely, um, oh yeah, Hunter's Mort safe. I agree. That's that makes sense too. <laughs> um, one of the things that's great about with Hunter's dissections of things of like the morphology, you know, or not morphology, but um, chasing the sort of from embryo to adulthood of all these different creatures, and then making these comparisons. It it sounds. Like today, we're like, well, that doesn't that doesn't work. You wouldn't want to do that. But to go and see it, I felt so um, impressed by what you can see by by watching all of the gestation from tiny thing to to full adult all through mm -hmm. this museum. That I I don't know whether it's just the preponderance of evidence or or what, but it is really impacting to see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, annoyingly for me, when I was writing my book. The museum was was closed because they were oh, refurbishing, right. renovating so that was it. Quite frustrating, um, and it's currently closed again. It's supposed to be reopening because <laughs> um, they're completely re redoing it and rebuilding it. So it's supposed to be opening, I think, in a year or two. Um, but it is quite amazing. I think um, you know he didn't he didn't intend it as a museum for the public. It was it was a, a research tool 
right. um, and also a teaching aid for his students. Um, but it's kind of, it's like the culmination of his life's work because right. he was just constantly, all, all his work was aimed at trying to understand this puzzle of how life on earth developed. Um, mm -hmm. So he was a kind of pre-evolutionist basically. Right. And so, you know, whereas you'd think that a museum would have um, like, all sheep's bits and all cat's bits and all monkey's bits in different parts. He worked according to organs of the body. So he had mm -hmm. um, a, a section on eyes. So you'd have the eyes of um, a, a <laughs> cat and a, a monkey and a human um, and, um, you know, wings and arms. So he was trying to understand how, um, you know, life had developed um, and, you um, effectively evolve so it, it, yeah it's quite it's fascinating from that point of view that he was grasping at this uh, theory you know nearly there you know he he w had worked out that we were that all species were descended from common ancestors and had evolved over thousands right. and thousands of years um so you know he was he was almost there um yeah it is fascinating work and i <clears throat> it's finally come up i've been waiting for this <laughs> <laughs> um we do we should at some point right we kind of have to 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 get there uh he he inflicts himself and and partly i'm impressed um partly i'm impressed because it's it's self-experimentation and some of the best things i mean i we search in our discovering pain medicine uh, discovering basically the the ability to knock yourself out with pain medicine um all of these things are really important to our history and he didn't do it on someone else you know, he mm -hmm. did experiment on himself. I think we have to give him kudos for that. Mm -hmm. However, this is a this is an interesting. Um, he didn't really get rid of it. So he thought he had, though, hadn't he? He gave himself syphil or venereal disease and then thought he had cured it, but but didn't mm -hmm. actually. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's maybe maybe a Darwin Award. That's possible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think one one reason I wrote the book was um, because there've been previous biographies of John Hunter by you know doctors and uh, medical historians, you know, very much revering him, um, you know, adulate, adulating him. And um, and none of them really accepted the idea, this, you know, <laughs> obvious fact that he'd um, experimented on himself with venereal disease and suggested that it, and it's kind of, it's sort of like um, honouring his name. So it, it somehow it was better that he'd done it on some pauper or done it on his um, <laughs> brother-in-law or whatever um so so kind of so I partly wanted to write the book because I wanted to you know I wanted to be warts and all so venereal warts and all really and um you know just kind of tell it as it is really and I, it's kind of very clear from all the evidence that I looked at that he did experiment on himself um yes. and um and you know so it was it was one of the, it was a um, a, a very foolhardy, but also very flawed experiment too, because yeah. he, he uses that, both gonorrhea. Yeah. Doesn't he use two different kinds of bacterium too? He, I think he, yeah, by mistake, he, he <laughs> aimed to infect himself with gonorrhea. Somehow that got cross-contaminated with syphilis as well. So he ended up getting syphilis. And from that made the conclusion that gonorrhea becomes syphilis. In fact, he somehow given himself both of them bad bad luck um and um yeah, i mean it's if we don't you know it's impossible to really say how much it actually affected him um clinically you know later in life because he it did become you know he he suffered from heart disease and he did become very irascible, irascible but um were, were those signs of tertiary syphilis it's, it's very mm. difficult to say really he, he surely yeah. inspired a lot of pop culture and science fiction of characters that experiment on themselves and yeah, uh, experiments gone right. wrong on themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I particularly love this. This um, there's a Japanese translation of my book, and then somebody I, produced a graphic novel um, in Japanese um, about. I had no That's idea. Fantastic. I think it might be based on my book, but I've no way of knowing really. <laughs> um, but that is that is John Hunter. In graphic oh, he looks very young. So it's, um, it's fabulous. <laughs> I wish I could read it. Somebody sent it to me. <laughs> I that that's high praise. I right right there. You know how many other anatomists have a graphic novel in Japanese written about them? Exactly. I feel like 
that kind of says it all, really. It all. Um, well, it's, the book's very popular in Japan, so they they really like the book keeps selling there. So that's good. So there's you guys in the comments are you guys are cracking me up. Um, <laughs> Um, this has been a great show. We've loved having you on. Uh, those of you who are uh, winners need to just just drop me a line so I can get addresses and things can be shipped off to you. And uh, I, I remember now who the winner of our naming contest is, and she wasn't able to make it tonight because she's at a roller derby, which is awesome. Um, she's in the roller derby, which is awesome. So I will let her know that uh, her her name won the name game for our cocktails. I hope all of you have now been introduced on uh, how to make your own shrub and we'll use it uh, responsibly uh, as in, in cocktails and that you will join us again for another one of our wonderful peculiar book clubs. And thank you so much, Wendy, for being here with us tonight. Oh, it's been, it's been a great pleasure. I really enjoyed it and um, enjoyed the cocktail too. <laughs> Don't forget, if you're joining us for Chuck Wending at 7 o'clock, it's a different YouTube link. So go back to the Peculiar Book Club YouTube channel. You'll see a different link for Chuck's episode. We're, me and Brandy are about to head there right now. And thank you, Wendy. It was a, very, it was a pleasure. Thank you. It was thank such you. a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> you got the blue bottle blues when you wake up in the night. There is no, no antidote 